the Clean Shipping Alliance is a standard not-for-profit uh, trade association representing a number of ship owners, 35 in total, who have taken the uh, step of installing exhaust gas cleaning systems, or scrubbers as they're more commonly known, into their vessels in order to comply with the revised MARPO Annex 6. There's the list of our members. We won't dwell too long, but you'll probably pick out quite a few names that you recognize there. This one's important because this is our driving force, our executive committee. And you can see there that we cover all different types of ship. So we've got cruise ships, we've got bulkers, we've got tankers, we've got heavy lift, we've got ferry, we've got row row, so, and car carriers. So we've got, we've got quite a broad perspective. That's the Secretariat, that's us. You don't really need to know about us, so we'll move on. Benefits of membership. We, we, find, we feel that it's important that we can share the issues that we have uh, identified. So we have technical discussions regularly. We've got one next week where we look at the issues around exhaust gas cleaning systems and what the solutions are for them. The reason I'm here, though, today is that last year saw the publication of three significant studies. The first was this one, which was the Carnival DN VPS um, study, where they looked at the wash water from exhaust gas cleaning systems. Because as I'm sure you're all aware, wash water has been a rather hot topic around um, the discussion and the use of exhaust gas cleaning systems, particularly with the number of states that are deciding they wish to ban the use of exhaust gas cleaning systems within their ports or, more worryingly, within their territorial waters. So what these studies were designed for, were, were looking at, was to see if there was any justification for these bans around the world. And the sample analysis for uh, the Carnival wash water covered a significant number of tests. The initial um, draft test or draft report came out in 2016 and that covered 79 samples but they then continued to sample for another two years so that we got up to nearly 300 samples by the time the next report was produced and the sample analysis showed quite clearly that the average PAH or polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons uh, and the nitrate levels unsurprisingly were well below the limits of the IMO wash water criteria. So what they did then was they compared it with other parameters. First one was the German wastewater ordinance, which is a quite strict um, point source requirement f f within Germany. And it was based on the rules for the steam generation plant and what they were permitted to dis discharge. And it showed as a percent of the limit that no criteria was in, in double figures, percentage-wise. In fact, the largest was the nickel content, and that was 4% of the allowable limit, so negligible against those rules. They then compared it to the EU incineration wastewater standards, which is an industrial emissions directive. Um, the discharge of exhaust gas cleaning, cyst, cleaning on, uh, on land, which is a bit stricter, but still the parameters came out again to show that although nickel was the highest, it was still only 7% of the, the allowable percentage um, in that, that level of requirement. We then looked, we then looked at um, EU surface water standards, which is amended in the Water Framework Directive from 2000. It's not a point source. This is a static water requirement, and so it, but it does have a measure for PAH and metals. And this again came out below the levels of accessible, acceptable um, readings. Finally, the one which was most interesting in my point was that they then went to the World Health Organization and looked at their drinking water standard and compared the wash water from exhaust gas cleaning systems and it still met that criteria. Now, I'm not saying that you should go out there and start drinking wash water from exhaust gas cleaning systems, but it wouldn't hurt you if you did. So the next, um, next study that sh which came out 
which came out shortly, very much uh, at the same time actually as the um, DMV EPS one, was one conducted by the Japanese. And it was the Japanese Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, Transport and Tourism, which is a, an interesting combination of um, ministries. What they were looking at was the effect on human health of the use of compliant fuel and the use of exhaust gas cleaning systems. They did some modelling work and they actually assumed a worst case scenario where 100% of ships operating in the areas where they were testing, which you can see listed up there, the CTOC, ICC and um, Tokyo Bay, 100% of ships to use exhaust gas cleaning systems. But again, I emphasise they were concerned about human health. And what we have to remember is the, fir the primary cause for this um, legislation, the MARP 1X6 air pollution, was around the damage that these particulates do to human health. The Japanese study discovered that because there's more of the finer particles, the 2.5 pm, in the exhaust from the, the compliant fuels, those do more harm to human health. Whereas if you're using an exhaust gas cleaning system with heavy fuel oil, you're removing a large amount of those particulates. Um, what they also then looked at was whether it was going to harm the uh, wildlife around the sea, so the crustaceans and the vertebrates of the fish, or just crustaceans. And I think what they found looking at the lethal concentration for crustaceans, it would have to be 20% of the limit, i.e. a five-fold di dilution, for 96 hours to do damage to, to these creatures. They found the five-fold dilution was happening in around three seconds, and a 5,000-fold dilution, so 10 times what was required, was happening after a minute. So the, whilst people say that the solution to pollution is not dilution, in this case, the natural sink for, sea, for sulfur is in the sea as sulfate. That's where more sulfur is than anywhere else in the world. And it's where it ends up ultimately anyway. There is a scientific um, theory that if you take all the sulfate out of the sea and make it a layer at the bottom of the sea, it would be approximately 1.5 metres deep. If you then take all the sulfur from all the known reserves and put that on top of that sulphur, you'd add the, the thickness of a piece of paper. So that puts it in perspective as to whether it's the right place to put the sulphur. But as I said before, don't forget that the sulphate, the sulphur that goes up in whatever fuel you're burning, will ultimately end up in the sea. And so it should. You can see here there was a number of parameters they were checking. pH in particular, there was no change. Um, the nitrates were in the current range and so was the um, chemical oxygen demand. It was, they were all pretty much within range. So the Japanese are firmly of the belief that there is absolutely no problem with ships operating with exhaust gas cleaning systems in their territorial waters, and their modelling supports it. As I say, they were working on 100% if we've only got 5 or even 10% of the vessels operating on exhaust gas cleaning systems, they're then going to have that measure, that uh, level less effect anyway. So the magnitude would be significantly less. Okay. The final one, which has only recently been released, is the C Delft study. And the C Delft study was slightly different because it was looking at the accumulation effect of the use of exhaust gas cleaning systems. Very similar to the DMVPS study, it compared the discharges uh, to the requirements of the various water framework um, conventions. The model assumed that they were using uh, 40 tons of fuel, or 40 tons of fuel was being consumed in port every day, 365 days a year. Now that represents somewhere in the region of 10 ferries being there for 12 hours a day, seven cruise ships being there for eight hours a day, uh, 24 general cargo ships, 28 bulk carriers, 16 container ships. 
not all, all of those groups together, but each of those groups independently within those ports, which again is a pretty worst case scenario. What was important was they compared these levels again to the water uh, conventions and they found there was negligib neg negligible accumulation of between 0.1% and 0.6% of the permitted limits. So not even 1% of the limits that have, are prescribed as acceptable was being reached, even with such a high consumption of fuel within the port limits. The 0.6% interestingly, was in a Baltic Sea where there was a limited tidal flow. And that, that model showed that 0.6% was perhaps going to happen. But even at 0.6%, that's not going to make a significant difference to the, the water quality around the port. And it's the significant thing, again, we mentioned before that um, Marp 6 was around air pollution and human health was a significant issue within that. When ships are in port or in territorial waters, that's when they're closest to human beings. So surely it makes sense to prevent those harmful chemicals going into the atmosphere, put them where they're going to end up anyway, directly into the sea. So there's your final conclusions. I think my time is up. So. We'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.